Right. So, first of all, before I start this talk, before I really start this talk, there are a few beliefs that I have that I would like to share with you. I think they're called credos in, in, the, um, in the religious world. So here, you saw that one a moment ago, so I'll skip over this one. But this one, I think, is very important. As usability professionals, we have a special obligation to ensure that all of the products that we make are highly usable. Interestingly enough, I see usability test reports that are not usable at all. I see talks by usability professionals that are not always very usable. Just to give you one small example, the final slide in a presentation by a usability professional should not say thank you and then the email address of the speaker. It should summarize the main points that the speaker has wanted to bring across. That very simple thing is not followed by many uh, UX professionals. In order to make usable stuff, we must, um, we must understand our stakeholders and their perceptions of us. Our stakeholders are often our users, yet we do very little investigation, contextual inquiry of our main users. We always concentrate on the end users, and they're certainly very, very interesting. But it's not always that we know a lot about our managers and other stakeholders. So what would you say, for instance, if your boss asked you for a UX strategy plan? How many of you would be able to just snap, snap, give your boss a UX strategy plan? One, okay. Yes. So what could be in a UX strategy plan? Well, here are some of the things that could be in it. I'm not claiming that I have the universal truth for, the, for this. The status of user experience as it stands, the status of user experience as we want it to be in three years' time, some of the ways in which we could get from the current state to the future state, what it would cost, and how we would determine objectively once we had reached the desired goal that we had actually come there. Our managers use words like KPIs and ROI. How many of you know what these terms mean? Okay, good, that's not bad. So if I asked you to give me a KPI for a user experience, what would that be? Clicks to completion. Excuse me? Uh, clicks to completion. Clicks to the completion. Okay. Or, yeah? Time on task. Time, Time on task. task. Yes, that's, uh, I think that's a good, I, I was almost going to say, how mo long time does it take to rent a car under these conditions on a car rental website, to be very specific? Yes? Task success rate. Task success rate, yes. Before I go on to talk about what bosses say and what they don't say, there's a very important topic that uh, I want to address, and that is usability maturity. Um, usability maturity, that's the level of understanding and implementation of a systematic human-centered design process in an organization. There are models for this built by academics, and they are actually quite useful. Here I have a simplified model with four levels. I think that's sufficient to understand what this whole thing is about. This model here has four, this model here has four levels. The incomplete, which is the worst, performed, organized, and innovating. And just relax, I'll explain in just a moment what each of these levels are about. And more importantly, if you're on one level, how to get to the next higher level. I enlisted Dilbert to get some help. Our product placed last in our own benchmark tests. And here's what the uh, boss does with uh, the report that, Gil that Dilbert has made up. So where is that company on the usability maturity scale? Actually, I have extended the model <laughs> with a fifth level 
That's what I call outright hostility. It actually says worse and worst. Yeah, it's worse than the worst level. That is unofficial. It's not in the ISO standards that we built this on, <laughs> but I certainly think it's highly relevant. There are organizations where if you talk about usability, your boss will call in and say, why are you bothering our nice programmers will all this talk about usability. Let's take, at the, let's take a look at the four levels. Here's the first one, the incomplete. Project managers say that they care about usability, but when it comes to allocating budget for it, nothing happens. Usability is fine if it comes for free, but nobody is interested in investing any resources for it. You might know companies who are like that. The next level is performed, where usability, some usability work is being done. It's carried out by enthusiastic uh, individuals, often as what Jacob Nielsen calls skunk work usability. That is, it happens in the dark, in the, in the dark of the night, unofficially. Informal usability tests are being run, some dedicated, some teams, enthusiastic teams, uh, work with it. The next one is organized. We have a description of the process. It is managed, budget is available, and it is being pursued systematically. And then the final level, which I have here in my model, the innovating, the human-centered design process is continuously improved to respond to changes aligned with organizational goals. I call this the usability in nirvana. <laughs> there are more levels. The full ISO model has seven levels, and it's not primarily about usability, but it is easily adaptable to usability, so I've taken the liberty of using that. The important thing of, is, of course, what can you do Oh, that is a quiz question. Yes, good. <laughs> so it's up to you. you. This time, you have two choices. If you're an organization with a low usability maturity, which of these six activities can you use to boost, usab to boost usability maturity? All right, let's have a look, see what the trends are. Wow. OK. This one is certainly a good idea. Run usability tests. That is the strongest instrument we have at our disposal to demonstrate to skeptical stakeholders that usability is not just about opinions and not just about making designs pretty. Conduct heuristic inspections to show the need for systematic usability work. Why do you think I have flagged that red? Why, is, why are heuristic inspections dangerous in an organization with low maturity? Opinions. Yes. The findings from the heuristic inspection will be dismissed as opinions. I, I, I voted for A and B because I thought I would do the heuristic thing and then I'd show that I was right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you could do that. But I would recommend uh, instead building prototypes and testing them. With these quiz questions, which we use a lot in our certification system, um, there are rarely qu uh, answers that are totally wrong. So we usually ask people to select the two that are most correct. Create personas and scenarios that show what real users of the new product are like. Again, that can be dismissed as opinions. Ask management to clearly express their commitment to usability. Uh, many stakeholders that I know of wouldn't care a damn about that. They look at action from management, not what management says. Right. So boosting the usability maturity, run usability tests, develop prototypes. And once you have done that, develop personas, scenarios, storyboards, and user journey maps, but only to show 
to demonstrate what a future system could be like. Case one, a solution in search of a problem. And here he comes again, the manager. I don't have, I don't have that many managers, at least not in pictures. So it's the same guy again, the boss. So what's the boss saying this time? He says, I want a carousel on the homepage. I can hear from your laughter that you probably met one of these managers. Maybe not that guy up there, but someone else who said similar interesting things. This is so widespread that some years ago I learned that there's a name for this. This is the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> the hippo. And often, immediately after showing this slide, I get, Rolf, how do you kill a hippo? <laughs> well, I don't recommend killing hippos. I recommend taming them. And you tame a hippo with usability tests of your own products, which they witness in person. And of course, they have a say about what tasks should be given and so on. So. Let's play this game a little bit. The boss says, I want a carousel on the home page. What could you answer? Well, my friend and colleague, Jared Spool, recently had that in his newsletter. And here's what he suggested. The, according to him, the UXer would say, why do you want that? The boss says, adding the carousel will give us more places to advertise the new content we're providing users. How does that make for a better experience for our readers? They will know about new things. And then the UX comes with a deadly remark. How does knowing about new things make for a better experience? What will they do with these new things that they can't do now? The boss says, oh, I'm not so sure. That is very idealistic. In the world where I live, bosses don't react like that. <laughs> They react, and I made that up, and this is my own scenario. The boss says, I want a carousel on the home page. Why do you want that? Because I know what our customers want. And I think I'm pretty good at having the right discipline to think through whether a lot of other people are going to want it too. He could have said something else. Let's get back to that in just a moment. <laughs> do, you know, do you know where I stole this from? Because I stole this from a very prominent person who said more or less those words. Who was that? Steve Jobs. Yes. Was it? <laughs> very good. Yes, Steve Jobs says that. And many people believe that if J Steve Jobs could say that, then there's no need for UX professionals. Because you just need a Steve Jobs. Right. So it's an adapted quote from Steve Jobs. Um, here is another approach. I want a carousel on the home page. Yes, sir. But then the UX adds, uh, we already tested the current approach without a carousel, and it tested quite well. Now, of course, we will need to retest it after we have made such an important change. I'm sure you will allow us this uh, small budget to just confirm that your uh, uh, intuition is right. And then you better have a, a good answer to the boss question. But if you insist, what is the cost of this usability test? But you probably have that. Because you insist on being measured. And then, of course, you know at any time what a usability test costs. Right. So that is actually my third credo. I didn't show you that uh, a moment ago. Data is important. Opinions are unimportant. Where do we get data from? We get objective data from usability tests. If we insist that these usability tests are opinion free, that is, we do not ask users in a usability test, or we should not ask users in a usability test, what do you think of this page? I don't care what they think about this page. What I care about is the data. Could they solve the task within a reasonable uh, time limit? 
Opinions are okay, but not in a usability test. We have other methods for handling opinion, like user surveys. The case two, the frustrated usability tester. That's a different theme. Um, Paul is a, well, read this. I don't want to read this aloud. Please read this. And Has everybody read this rather long text? Good. Let's move on. What are the causes of Paul's trouble? I've tried to list three here. I, I'm sorry, I've listed six here. Please give me your, uh, I think three of them are significantly more correct than the other ones. Can you find them? The general point behind this question is that not all usability professionals are usable or deliver usable products. So let me see here if I can convince it to move on. Yes. Oh, that's not too bad. Paul's usability test reports are too long. I definitely agree with that. Paul's remarks show insufficient respect for the development team. He should not characterize them as lousy, making lousy interfaces. The usability test sessions should be conducted in rooms that are closer to the places where they work. The video is too short. At least 30 minutes are required to fully understand. Fortunately, no one voted for that. <laughs> What he is suggesting is probably a video with a talking head. And that's deadly. Never do that. It can be OK to provide a video summary from a usability test. But by all means, include clips of what happened during that usability test. No talking heads. So how about this one? The high number of problems found indicates that developers should learn about the basic usability to prevent usability problems. Well, he should not report that many problems in the first place. It may be that there are many usability problems. That's not unusual. But he should present a manageable number of uh, problems in his report. Otherwise, his report may be, ejected, may be rejected simply because it's unusable. I uh, pointed it out here. All the red underlines is where there are problems. Any comments or questions on that? Good. So the final case, and I stole this from Jared Spool, from my friend Jared Spool. And Jared says, no matter how much you try, you can't stop people from sticking beans up their nose. <laughs> and I think that is very precise what happens in some organizations. So I, therefore, I stole his quote. Well, I didn't steal it because I give credit for it. Here's another one. The boss, uh, remember, this is the same. It starts out the same way. The boss says, I want a carousel on the home page. The UXO, why do you want that? Because it's the right thing to do. How does that make for a better experience for our readers? They'll love it. How do you know they will love it? My experience says that many will consider it a nuisance. And then this one, sorry if I hurt your professional pride, but that is what we will do. <laughs> Full stop. That is what happens in real life. And I haven't sent this to Jared yet, but I will eventually do it. He and I know one another reasonably well. So I'm curious what he says about that. Well, he will say that's totally unrealistic. That's what happens in my world when you meet a hippo.
So, but Jared has a very nice conclusion. He says, if people continue sticking beans up their nose, consider moving on. Um, I decided, um, no. I can work with others that aren't about to stick beans up their noses. There are plenty of those. And it's much less frustrating for everyone involved. I think that's so true. But at the same time, I have also experienced people who got very tired of their managers sticking beans up their noses, and they quit. And on the day they quit, the management announced, it was not related in any way, that they were going to introduce some of the measures that the UX professional had advocated for a long time. So remember, even when the captain is willing, it takes long, it takes time to change the course of a super tanker. That is a happy UX professional here, <laughs> and he is a, <laughs> he's slow, he or she is slowly turning the super tanker in the right direction. When people ask me how long time should we give people, then I would say, and that is definitely a rule of thumb, about two years. If nothing happens after two years, consider moving on. Yes, and the summary, a shameless self-promotion. <laughs> the multiple choice questions that you have seen in this and the previous talk are examples of what you will meet if you are interested in UX certification. These are the kind of questions that we ask people when they want to get UX certified. And here's a link to where you can read more about our certification scheme, cpux.org or uxqb.org. End of shameless self-promotion. This is what I've been trying to say. Any questions? Yes. Uh, at least in terms of the voices that I'm listening to, uh, there seems to be some sort of consensus of some sort of need for certification that is recognised. And you've alluded to some that you do. I'm sorry, I haven't actually. Um, I wasn't actually aware of it. That's fair enough. You're not the only one. I just had an audience of 50 people in Bristol. No one had even ever heard of any kind of UX certification. The idea that you could be certified, and there are other schemes that the one that we promote, no one had ever heard about them. So Mike Montero is, is obviously very vocal, and he's one of the voices that seems to be making a big case. Especially in the design area, I understand. And we are certifying people on the foundation level which is just general, do you understand the 120 basic terms in our field? And then we have specialized certifications for user requirements, for usability testing, and in two to 10 years time, also for design, for the basic design, prototyping, information architecture, and so on. So I guess my question is, sorry, sorry, I know. Not that's fine. Um, is, is what the main advantage of certification for you is? I'm sure there are many, but the main, the main thing is. The main thing is that, that there are two main things. One thing is that you get a chance to filter out voodooists, people who work very superficially with user experience. And number two, and I think that's actually the most important for me, is that we get a common vocabulary. So if I say persona and you say persona, we actually mean the same thing. I've seen some users, when they said personas, they meant what I call a user profile, which is something different. I've seen people who had a different understanding of usability testing than I had doesn't mean that my perception is right, but I think it's about time, if we want to be considered a mature profession, uh, that we have a common vocabulary. There was some work done on this with the uh, uh, UXPA Book of Knowledge, 
about 15 years ago. Unfortunately, it has not been maintained, but that was not bad work, what these people did. <coughs> so we're picking up on this. And anyone, even if you don't want to be certified, our curricula, our definitions are freely available for you to download. Everything we make, well, except for the secret exam questions, is publicly available. You can go in and study it. We try to be very, very transparent. Yeah, I, so, so I've been doing this kind of stuff for a really long time, and uh, I, I guess when, when UX was like really a, a, a really new term, anyone who called themselves a UX or whatever called themselves an information architect and things like that, but most of them knew a whole bunch of stuff about HCI and, and uh, all the you know all the all the good usability principles, and yes. now there seems to be. And this is uh, my question: is like, is my perception right? There seems to be a lot more people now who uh, sort of call themselves a the UX designer because they know how to use like a design package, and, yes. uh, and there's like this missing layer of knowledge underneath. That it, is that just my, my jadedness, or is that something you've experienced as well that you've seen? Mm -hmm. like, I have certainly seen that. The worst examples that I have seen was with a bank that I was working for where I was introduced to someone who was, uh, uh, who was a u uh, usability expert. And he was a usability expert because it said so on his business card. <laughs> he had been working, he had a banking education and he had been working with usability for three months. And then they put usability expert on his uh, business card. That was not a very nice experience. And he was a little bit ashamed of it himself. On the positive side, I would say that the universities are, these days are producing a lot of students who have heard about good usability as part of their studies. More and more universities are offering courses in usability and user experience. And even though these courses are not optimal, they are a lot better than what we had 10 or 15 years ago. I've had students myself, I used to teach at the University of Copenhagen, and they had taken the courageous uh, step of making this course mandatory. So I had about 250 students, and some of them were not very enthusiastic about usability. So it was my tough job to make sure that they did a few interviews and that they did a few usability tests. And some of them, after, not all of them, but some of them after the course came back and said, Rolf, I've learned two things. Number one is I will never be a usability profession. <laughs> Number two is thank you very much for showing me that my world is very, very different from the users. And I said, very good, very good. That is the key message that I wanted to tell you about. So there is hope. Yeah. No, no. Oh, just a small point to pick up. Um, he said the uh, personas, user journeys, experience maps should only be used to describe the future state, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly. Mm -hmm. What's your objection for using them to describe the current state? That's certainly a very good idea. And we, we advocate that in our curriculum. I think they are mostly being used to describe the future but they can certainly also be used to describe what I call the current miserable state of affairs. <laughs> so in our curriculum, we actually distinguish between so-called as-is scenarios, the current state, and use scenarios, which you could also call future scenarios, if you wish, that represent the, the future state. So I totally agree with you, okay. but I do take certain shortcuts in my slides Perfect. in order not to get into long discussions. But thank you very much for bringing up that point. Um, the, the, the quote from uh, Jared School about people, you can't stop them sticking things up their nose, right. and if they do, then you take the skills elsewhere. So that came under a bit of fire uh, because it, it was considered a very, very privileged uh, perspective. Some, some people in the design world don't have uh, the, the privilege of being able to say goodbye to a, a pay packet for a month mm -hmm. and move on to the next mm -hmm. job very easily. Um, 
I just want to pick up the point that you brought up, the Mike Montero. It, it was less about certification, but more about licensing. Is there a way that we can, like doctors and lawyers have, that we can empower designers to say no to their bosses? And if they say no, they'll have the backup of the whole community. And the idea, I was just wondering what you thought about that. So if, if as a designer, you not only become certified, but you, you sign up to a rule of ethics and conduct and a license, and you can be called out by other designers saying, that checkbox was unethical, that's a dark pattern, uh, we're going to revoke your license. Uh, what do you think about that idea? I hadn't realized that there's a st distinction between licensing and certification, but you make a good point, but I don't have any additional comments on it. Uh, I think it's a valid point. I often compare our profession to doctors, and like you say, doctors have, they, they have an, what's it called, an oath? That they, yes, exactly. They have an oath, and which means that they are bound by certain rules, and that would be very helpful for you ex-professionals to have that too. But then we're a little bit back in the previous talk that I did about ethics. There's more to it here. It's not just, it's not unethical not to know what the definitions of certain terms are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm advocating here. But again, if you go back to the doctors, doctors have very strict definitions of all the bones and all the things that you have in your body. Mm -hmm. And that is very helpful. And it's even the same all through, all over the world. Wouldn't it be nice if we became so mature that we had a similar thing in our community. Okay, if there are no more questions, can we thank you all for coming